Okay. Alright, so why don't we uh, start off with you saying your name and then um, start and maybe talk, talking about where you grew up. And where, okay, yeah. where I'm from. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm Alan Shopney. I grew up uh, north of Tipton, Indiana on a farm. Uh, back at that time, Tipton was in the same athletic conference as Plymouth, the CIC. I ran track uh, four years and uh, I couldn't run cross country till my senior year because my father needed me on the farm. So the coach talked to my father and tried to get them to let me run cross country my senior year, which I did. Then I went to Manchester College and was fortunate to have a good career there. Varsity, four years of cross country and track and uh, was on uh, two conference championship teams in cross country. So uh, from there, I went to uh, Ligonier. Um, my first three years of teaching uh, was at Ligonier. I was the cross country coach and uh, the track coach. Odd situation, I wanted to coach and uh, they told me they didn't have a position for me, but uh, they, when they signed my first contract for $4,800 for the year, uh, they gave me an extra $100 and said I could coach as much as I wanted anything, which I wasn't sure. But uh, cross country started, and uh, at that time the basketball coach had the cross country, so I showed up for the first practice I never saw the basketball coach ever again at a practice. I was the coach. So I was the coach there for cross country and track. Um, my wife was there too. Uh, she's a Manchester graduate, Manchester College graduate. And so we both taught there and then uh, we decided to leave there because they had a consolidation problem. Uh, Ligonier, Wawaka and Cromwell were consolidating and each of the schools wanted their share of the pie of the new school that was going to be um, erected and it was just a kind of a messy situation so we decided to look elsewhere and we interviewed lots of places and Plymouth was the first place that wanted both of us at the same time. So we came here and they didn't have a coaching position for me which was fine and uh, but then coming here in the fall of 66 then after the fall of 67 Jack Mayfield, the coach here, a football coach, was also the track coach. He left uh, Plymouth and became the coach at uh, Hanover College. So that opened up a track position. So the next spring I was a half-time track coach. And then the fall of 68, uh, they hired me as a cross-country coach. And I stayed there for 41 years. So, uh, and I left track after about six years, but I stayed on as cross-country. So it's been a good career uh, in cross country. My first uh, experience of cross country at Plymouth, we had four boys that showed up for the team. There was no girls at that time. And one of the boys said, well, if we're going to forfeit every meet, because you have to have five to score, if we're going to forfeit every meet, I'm not going to run. So that left me with three guys. So I looked around and looked around and talked to people and found two or three more and the boy that decided that he was going to quit decided to come back out if we're going to have a scoring team. And uh, I had a very small team that year and the next year. And then from then on, the, the team began to grow. And uh, after a few years, I could have 25, 30, 35 guys out for cross country. And uh, the program just seemed to work for itself and uh, work very well. So you ran only one year of cross country in high school. That's right. Um, so what was it about it, that sport that, that attracted you? What did you like about it? Well, I was a middle distance runner and I'd like to run more in high school, but dad needed me home on the farm. So I would go home after school and do chores and, and help with the farming. Uh, before I went to Manchester, the coach there sent me a letter inviting me to run. And I was ecstatic. I, you know, I didn't have any 
desire necessarily or any aspirations of running in college, but after receiving that letter, I, oh, I was in. So, and uh, the first meet, uh, I did so-so. I didn't know what I was doing. At high school at that time, you ran two miles. In the college at that time, they ran four miles. So I didn't know what to expect or what I was doing, and I didn't have any really major summer base of mileage. Just went out and ran the meet. Um, and then the next meet uh, was away at Taylor University. And uh, I asked the coach whether or not I could go. Well, he had one spot left on his van. He said, yes, you can go. So I went there, and it was one of those uh, breakthrough moments for me. We toured the, the course, and I thought, well, this is not so bad. So we took off, and I ran with a lead group, and we came around the track to where the finish line was supposed to be, and no one stopped. And then the light came on. We have to do it twice. That was just the first lap. That was two miles. We have to run two more. Okay, so I'm in the lead group, and I kind of stay with the lead group. And then we finished, and um, Taylor University's uh, football field is on the west side of the campus, at least at that time, and there's a woods on the west of there. And I came around the track, and I'd learned you'd never look back, but I heard this person running behind me. And I kept bringing up the pace as I went around the, the back stretch, and as I picked up the pace, he picked up the pace. I came around, and I was sprinting all out, and I came across the line and turned around, and there was no one behind me. Now, what was I hearing? I found out that at that time, we, the, the tracks were cinders, and you wore spikes, and when you ran on cinders, a little glob of cinders would come up, you kick them up, and then they come down. Well, with the woods being there, there were leaves on the track, so those little pieces of cinders would come down on the uh, leaves, and that was the phantom behind me. Those are my those are my steps behind me. So I placed in the top five for the team that day. Realized I could run at that pace. I was varsity from then on for the rest of my career. So a kind of a breakthrough oddity. You just needed someone, you know, yeah. needed a ghost behind you. <laughs> yeah, a ghost behind me, and also to realize I could run at that pace. Yeah, you stayed with the lead back yeah. for yeah. Right. So that's a good career. So who, who were some of your coaches at uh, Manchester? Well, it's interesting. At Manchester, Darrell Hartzler, uh, my freshman year, was a junior. Uh, they didn't have another one on staff, and he'd been uh, varsity for two years. And he, they asked him to take over the team. So my freshman, sophomore year, uh, our coach was a junior and senior. He was on the team. So. And he had a VW bus, a little mini bus, and that was our transportation. No fancy college bus at that time. So that was an interesting situation. So uh, would you say that you, you know, learned any coaching style as you developed your coaching style from uh, having a guy who was only a couple of years older than you, right? Yes, we, uh, we ran together. And I was fortunate, it's one of those things when occasionally, whether it's a high school or college, a group of guys or gals come through together and they excel. If you come through at another time, you wouldn't have had that group experience. You might have excelled yourself, but you didn't have the support. Uh, I came at a time when there was a good group of freshmen, and we pushed the coach. He was going to be the lead runner, and he was, had the flu early in the season. And I watched him run straight into a tree. He was pushed himself to the point where he was ready to black out because we freshmen were pushing him and he was not going to let us buy him. And I watched him go right into a tree. And so the rest of his life, he had a scar here where it broke his cheekbones. Uh, but uh, yes, he developed uh, us along the way. And my running buddies, we, we did all right. So I developed my ideas of running and training and so what uh when you when you started coaching how did you um what was your approach to to well back in those days there wasn't a lot of science involved in running in fact uh my first uh 
first day of practice could have been my last day because I didn't know where the course was. I didn't know I hadn't met any of the guys. There was no preseason. Just showed up in the gym or the locker room and okay, here are the guys. And um, I didn't know where they were going to run except I've been told that the basketball boys, you have to watch them because they're not out there to run cross country. They're out there simply to get in shape because they're forced to be by the coach. So I decided to do an out and back. We'll go out for you know 10 or 15 minutes, run out. I'll drive my car. We'll turn around. I'll drive, turn you around, and you come back, and that's fine. So at that time, Ligonier, uh, State Road 33, went west of town uh, a few miles, then turned uh, uh, north toward Goshen. Or you turn south to State US 6 and come back in uh, 6 north of Plymouth here and goes to Kendallville. And... Um, so I stayed with the basketball boys and they were jogging along just so finally I looked at my watch and thought it's time to turn them around. So I went up to the lead runner. I said, you the lead runner? And he said, yes. I said, well, we need to turn around. So I turned everybody around and going back. Well, when I got back to the basketball boys, they were already gone because it was time to go. So they turned around and sprinted back to the gym. You know, they were done with practice. So I waited for the lad, that lead runner to finally come back in and, okay, we're packed up and going. The next morning, I uh, was in the parking lot and a boy came up to me and said, Coach, why didn't you stop me? I said, what do you mean? Well, I was running out there and I got out to 33 when it turned north and you hadn't stopped me, so I went to the first farmhouse and called my mother and she came after me. And she says, I can't run cross country now because uh, you didn't turn me around. And I'm standing there stunned. I thought, what? <clears throat> I stood there a while and he walked off. So then I decided to go on in the building. Another boy walked up and said, coach, why didn't you stop me? What is this? Uh, he'd gone out to where it turned north toward Goshen and he turned south toward US 6 and he finally found some water at a, uh, a roadside park there. <clears throat> he got home, he said it was about dark and I figured he ran about 12 miles, his first practice, and his mother said he couldn't run cross country. And I'm at a loss. Here I am, I've lost the top two runners. I'm my number three guy, can't count, and doesn't realize where he is on the team. So uh, I went to both parents after school that day, talked to them and reassured them that the Greenhorn coach would uh, be more, uh, concerned about the team. But then I really didn't know. I didn't have a, really a whole list of the guys and I couldn't, you know, the guys, basketball guys, they'd left. So I didn't know, I had no way of keeping track of all of them. But I kept track from then on. As, and I figured my backup profession then would be sales because I was able to convince two families that uh, their kid was safe in my care. And that was your first practice? That was my first practice. <laughs> I assume it went up from there. Huh? It did go up from there, yes. So when you got to uh, Plymouth, was there was there more of a cross country um, community set up already, or was that there, there's a team here, mm -hmm. but uh, not a stellar team. A couple of uh, good runners and, and you know, some support guys, but uh, just six or seven guys, and that was it. And uh, they didn't have a coach that had a running background, so you know. And he was simply assigned that position, so it's no fault of his. He was simply told, okay, you have the cross-country team. So in my first couple of years here, I started paying attention to the guys and giving them some hints along the way. And one of the lead runners was George Cook, who ended up uh, doing well. And uh, years later, was my assistant coach for several years. So uh, we started small, but we grew from there. When, uh, when did you feel like the program had kind of was starting to get some momentum? You know, when it started to feel like you... Uh, along about the era of uh, Charlie Fox, Charles Fox, who was a state uh, placer in both cross country and track, uh, outstanding runner, and he and his cousins and some other guys who were uh, pretty good at running, uh, we started to put the team together. We started taking uh, 
summer uh, training trips up to the Warren Dunes. Uh, and then we developed a program where we started uh, Pokagon State Park, Turkey Run State Park, different, you know, Clifty Falls, different ones. Uh, and the team really came together when some mothers got together and proposed to my wife that uh, she and they go along and cook for us. And so when we're simply out there running, we all we needed to do was train. We didn't have to worry about diet. Because prior to that, we'd have to, each person was responsible for their own food. And so would, some would take steaks or something fancy and then a cooler and the, we'd run out of ice in the cooler and, and they were cooking steaks that had been warmed up for a couple of days. <laughs> or they'd take some canned stuff instead of warming it up. They were so hungry when they came back from running, they'd simply open up and eat it cold. So our diet was not good. So uh, my parents had a cabin uh, just a mile from the west entrance, Brown County State Park. So the mothers and my wife would stay at the cabin and we'd camp out at the park and uh, they became uh, the cooks. And of course, their sons graduated and my wife stayed on <laughs> as the head cook and we'd uh, uh, recruit other mothers to go along each year, in some cases the dads too. How, so, uh, how long would you normally do that? We do it for a week uh, prior to school. Back at that time, school didn't start till almost Labor Day, and so we would uh, early August we'd have a week at uh, Brown County and uh, develop courses down there, different distances, uh, different trails, uh, and that was much better than running at say Turkey Run State Park. It's rather rough, and I nearly lost a couple guys there. They'd fall and trip over tree roots and smash into rocks and things like that. But uh, Brown County with uh, my wife as chief cook and the mothers going along, that was really the basis of a ongoing program. So it was a nice uh, team building activity and away from all the distractions of yes. uh, everything. Yeah. And they came in with a running base. We set up summer mileage goals and guys would run summer mileage so they came in in shape uh, most of them and uh, then we had a requirement you had to run so many miles to qualify for camp which was fair because we didn't want someone come in with zero or very limited mileage and end up with blisters and pulled muscles and and not being able to run with the rest of the team so you had to come in in shape because we we put in the miles so he said, uh, tell me a little bit more about Charles uh, Fox. He said he was your first, uh, you know, cross-country star, or how was he? Well, I've researched a little bit, and yeah. we find out that uh, Plymouth had other runners mm -hmm. that went to state and track or other, and I don't have all the stats. I need to do more research on that. But uh, he was a runner that uh, did well, did a lot of summer mileage, uh, ran a lot of road races, and back at that time, there, every weekend there was a road race someplace. And uh, the fact that he was doing well, others wanted to tag along with him, and they did well too, so that was yeah. good. Yeah. So, um, did he, did you, did he go down state with you, or did you? Did well, he... as an individual, he qualified for state. He ended up in ninth place as a, in cross country. And then the spring that year, he got third in the two mile. So that was good. And then he went to Notre Dame on a running and academic scholarship. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so after him, who, uh, who else kind of comes to mind? Well, now you say after him, ah. I have a long list of guys. Yeah, well, hey. And some gals too. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as I start naming them, You'll forget them. I'm going to forget <laughs> somebody. And, well, I've or and I've already been chastised by some parents at different times that I didn't mention their their oh, child. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I will just pull out one, uh, Pete Bigler, uh, who won state cross country as an individual. Uh, so, uh, and he had a support staff. Uh, good group of guys because we had uh, we had a three year span. We were sixth second and third as a team in the state. And in cross country, there's no class. You're all in the same same boat. And then uh, years later in 2006, we got 10th in the state. 
So I had four teams that uh, placed the state for the boys. The girls, I never took a girls team. I had some individuals go, but uh, not as a team. So what, uh, um, so you said you had a team that placed third, or did you say second? Sixth, second, and third, Sixth. three years in a row. Wow. And uh, back at that time, well, of course, cross country changed. It used to be two miles. Then it went to two and a half miles. And eventually it went to metric, which is 5,000 meters, 5K, which is 3.1 miles. And uh, later girls joined in. I'll mention the name Carol Cushman. She was my first girl that decided to come out and run. She ran with the boys. There was no girls' competition, just ran in the boys' meets. And, uh, and they moved girls around different distances. Uh, it's interesting, uh, the girls uh, ran with the boys during the season, and then when they started the girls' tournament, they ran less, a shorter distance, which I never figured out. And a few years ago, they moved the girls up to 5K too, from 4K to 5K. And there was some concern whether or not they could be able to do that. Well, it's no problem. Girls can head up quite well. So a lot of changes over the years in terms of the mechanics of the, of the racing. So did, uh, did Carol face any sort of challenges when she would run with the boys? Was it, how was that for her? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, she's just out doing her own thing. She was no other girls on the team to compete with. And, and uh, once in a while, another team would have a girl in the boys' race, too. And uh, there's no special pressure or anything. Just do what you can do. It's fine. And it's interesting. Uh, I can't remember. I'll check my notes here. It's 19, 1981 had the first girls' sectional, which is interesting because during the season, um, the girls could run with the boys. But then when they came to sectional, they had to run the girls only could run against girls. So first year we had a girl sectional, and then the next year they started competition in the, in the conference with dual meets. And uh, can you think of any other um, female runners that were that did great? <laughs> I had many. If you're going to put me on the spot and. Uh, well, I'm not going to mention anyone specific because I'm going to miss some. Okay. Well, do you? Um, well, I one, one of the girls that ran for two years for me was Morgan Usney, and she ended up being an Olympian. Uh, but she didn't run her junior and senior year, so. Oh really? Did she? I mean, I, you know, it doesn't have to be. Uh... <laughs> uh, but I had several girls that uh, were conference champions and. Uh, uh, I had several guys who were conference champions. So. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, how about some? How about some of those teams that placed well? You don't have to name any individuals, but. Uh, maybe well, some I started to mention that uh, we had some guys that came in. They did well in the AAU uh, at the junior high level. Uh, did well nationally in meets, and so I knew I had some good guys coming in when they were freshmen. And um, so when they were came in, we seemed to dominate the conference. And then uh, there were times I had a team that was so good that, that we just run as a pack. Just put five guys out in front of everybody or more, six, seven guys out in front of their, their number one team and we just run. And uh, most other coaches understood that. But once in a while, uh, a coach would uh, be upset that we were showing off or, well, what was I supposed to do? Was I supposed to tell my guys to go out and beat each other up every race? No, you didn't need to do that. Wait for the big meets and then we'll do that. Um, and then, of course, over the years they changed. They used to be qualified so many go to state, you know, so many teams, then they expand that so more guys go to state. And, uh, and then they, extended also to uh, individuals. If you weren't on a team going, you could qualify to go to state. Prior to that, unless your team made it, you didn't go, unless you're in the top 10. But now they have other individuals go. It's, it's better. Um, in 1985, uh, we really 
could have and should have been at state, but we had flu that week. And uh, so we placed uh, fifth at uh, semi-state and then it took the top four at that time. Now they take more teams. Um, and it was tough. Uh, that team was really on a goal to go to state. So the next Monday after we got beat at semi-state, I came in the locker room and all the guys were sitting there dressed ready to run. And I said, what's the deal, guys? And they said, the season is not over. We practiced that week, every day, just as if we were going to the state. And uh, after the state meet, we ran the course. And then for the next three years, we qualified. And, uh, so and then just two or three years later, they moved it up to so top five teams go to state instead of top four. Oh, wow. <sighs> so we could have had another state scoring effort. Uh, that sounds like a, a very determined uh, team. It was. Yeah. Yes. So were they, they came in together well, as they, freshmen or were they? Well, it was over kind of two or three year span. They weren't all in the same grade, but they came together. Several of them were. And uh, they were so into running that uh, we ran two day practices and morning and afternoon. They'd come in of a morning, it was voluntary, but they'd come in and, and meet the school and go out and do a run that morning and come back, and shower. We'd eat breakfast together. The guys would bring in the cereal, milk, and we had the uh, training room was right next door with the refrigerator, so we always kept milk in the refrigerator. And they each had their food and bowls and so forth in, the, in their lockers. And so um, that worked. Several years later, I didn't have that caliber of guys or that interest, and so we stopped the two-a-day practices. There's no point in wearing somebody out if they can't handle it. But those guys, they could handle it, so there's no problem. So I think it was about those guys that, you know, they were so determined to what brought them together as a team. Well, part of it was talent. They had basically had some running talent. It's obvious, particularly in track, where it's, you can see them compete in different events. Uh, and then they were good friends, good buddies, and they just enjoyed being with each other. So it just fed off, they fed off of each other. You know, you're doing this, or what are you doing? You do this, I can do that too. So it was good. Yeah. So um, did you notice over the years that, um, like, did you notice a trend among, you know, runners who were good, like some characteristics of good runners and, or like, you know, their mental toughness or what, you know, what makes a good runner, I guess? Well, one of the things, you have to be willing to put in the miles. In distance running, you don't get there without putting a base. And those guys that put in the off-season mileage, they're the ones that excel. And if they started to excel, then they bought into running more and more often. And I always tried to get the guys to uh, train in the off season, particularly in the winter. Um, several of the guys were on the basketball team, which is good. If they weren't there, I encouraged them to be a swimmer. You know, cross training. Today we call it cross training. We didn't call it cross training then. But, uh, um, and if they weren't doing a winter sport, I tried to get them to do some out in the snow, do some Training that way. And of course, I expect everyone to run track. I mean, if you're a runner, you, you have two seasons. Uh, Indiana, we don't so much here, but there's an indoor season. And uh, down central Indiana, they're more into uh, indoor season, January and February, March, before you move outdoors into the cold. <laughs> so the, the, the people who are willing to put the work in uh, off season, generally yes. did, did well. They did well. And I encouraged some of them, uh, that tapered off after a while, but kept, kept a log. Write down what you're doing. So you can look back and see, well, you know, I slacked off that week, or I, here's my mileage is coming up. And how'd you feel? You know, if, uh, if it's wearing you out, cut down on the mileage. You don't have to do so much. Uh, you know, lower the distance, raise the pace. That might be better. Uh, little techniques, how you tweak those. But I couldn't do that for every guy on the team or every gal. Keep your own log, write it down. 
and uh, encourage them to have a log in their locker. So after practice, you come in the locker room and, and uh, of course, I wasn't in the girls' locker room, but the girls were in the boys' locker room. Oh, how'd that work? Well, the guys are dressed and the girls would come out and that's where we had team meetings. But then the training room was right next door, so any girl that needed to go to the training room had to cut through the boys' locker room. They did that for years. Yeah. And they'd yell, coming through, and they'd walk through. And uh, Of course, that wouldn't have worked if it was a girls' locker room. Guys could have walked through the girls. That would have been, no, no. It was okay for the girls to walk through the boys' room. But uh, we'd always have meetings, girls and guys, when the girls had a girls' team. And... Uh, compare notes, you know, give me feedback. And so I kind of, not everyone spoke, but they could say, you know, we, we need more speed or we need this or we need, I think we need to do that interval workout again. Um, and then pretty soon you work out on courses. Where, where can you train? And it's tough to go out and run on roads all the time because that's not where your course is, but we couldn't go out and run at the country club every week or every day. The golfers didn't want us out there all the time. And besides, you always had problems with transportation. But it got so that uh, back at that time, everyone could drive and we'd want to make sure, okay, who can drive today? You can take four, you can take three, okay. Does everyone have a ride? And then we'd go someplace and run. Um, some people would like for us to, or at one time they said, well, why don't you just run at Centennial Park? No, you're not going to run, 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 run. Uh, no, no, that's that's not going to work. 3.1 miles run circles. No. Um, sometimes we'd run at the cemetery around the perimeter because most of the time you're on grass. You, it's pavement from here to there, but you're on grass. Uh, sometimes the road runs, we'd uh, go out to Nutmeg, which is part of the Blueberry Stomp course, which uh, I was one of the five guys that started that originally. Really? Jeff Gangoff and his parents started, but then some other guys came in and they, and I helped them for several years and then I dropped off the board because I couldn't get my team ready, my high school teams ready and be working on the, the stomp too. So, but then uh, my wife and I have property out south of town. We have 23 acres, so we have trails. And so uh, there's a repeat course at my house that we could do quarters. And then there's about uh, seven or 80 yards from the finish of the quarter back to the start. And we have a water hydrant there. So, and it's on grass most of the way. And it's in the shade and there's some elevation change. And so that worked out quite well. So uh, a couple times a week, sometimes we go to coach's house. We come out. And interestingly enough, they still come to coach's house. So they're out there in the summer or in the fall, and uh, coach tells me when they're coming out. They can come out anytime because we, my wife and I, mow the, the trails and pick up the limbs, and and there's another loop, loop a couple other loops they can run different distances. That's so that's helpful. And back when I had the uh, outstanding teams, they would sometimes run from the school to my house, and from my driveway to the front door, the or from the to the door where we came into the gym, 3.1 miles. <laughs> now why that worked out, I don't know. But they'd run to my house, that was their warm up. We'd do an interval workout and they'd run back to school for warm down. So they were doing six miles, just warm up and warm down, plus the interval. And then I had some teams that couldn't handle that, that volume. So we'd drive to Coach's house, get, you know, everyone had a ride, so we'd go out and do an interval workout and come back. We'd do a warm up and warm down there. But uh, that's been interesting. So my last year of coaching, uh, the girls gave me a sign that says, uh, repeat run. So we have that sign out there at the start of the quarter at my house. So it's still there. Uh, what year did you retire? I retired from teaching in 2006. And I had to coach three more years. I couldn't give it up. So the fall of six, seven, and eight. So my last year of coaching cross country is 2008. So what, uh, so you couldn't give it up, huh? No, I was locked in. Yeah. And of course, parents would encourage me, well, stay on, I want you to coach, you know, my younger son or my younger daughter. 
or someone say, I want you to coach my kids too. And I said, what grade do you have? They said, third. No, 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 that's not going to work. So uh, you probably or, saw a lot of families over the years. Yes, I had some second generation runners, mm -hmm. yeah. So when you took, um, so what was it like when you had teams go down to the state uh, championship, you know, the state tournament, like what, how did that feel? <laughs> <laughs> Great, <laughs> uh, exciting. Uh, and to know that uh, you're in the top echelon in the state against some of the big boys, so to speak, or the larger schools, or those that had uh, traditional long history of outstanding programs, and uh, know that you could compete with them, uh, that was good for your ego, I suppose, and uh, really helped uh, recruit. Um, as I said, it was tough recruiting in the early years. You know, go around and talk to guys, talk to guys on the track team and say, hey, you really need to run cross country in the fall too. And some would and some wouldn't. But uh, once the program had its base, uh, I'd simply announce a sign-up sheet for cross countries in the office and they'd come in and they'd fill up the sheet. You know, I didn't have to go out and, you know, once in a while you talk to somebody and kind of, they need a little nudge, but uh, just put out the sheet and they go in and sign up and uh, have information for summer runs or about the summer camp. So there's no problem. Okay. So, rivals. Who are your main rivals? <laughs> <laughs> main rivals. Well, Warsaw's course is conference. And, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Plymouth being in the same conference as my high school in Tipton, back then the CIC, um, the northern tier was uh, Plymouth, Rochester, and Warsaw. They were in the CIC. The southern tier was Tipton, Elwood, Alexandria, and Muncie Bruce. And all those schools in between, Huntington and Peru and Hartford City and Monticello, and, and uh, it was a large conference. Um, so the competition conference-wise with Plymouth and Warsaw was uh, there before um, it became the NLC. And when I was in college, someone said, well, where would you like to coach? And I said, probably CIC school, because that's what I'm familiar with. And I was in Plymouth several years before I realized I was at a CIC school. I just never thought about it, because uh, Plymouth had already changed and dropped out of the CIC, and, and uh, um, Rochester, Warsaw, and Plymouth were in the NLC. So after several years, I thought, ah, oh, I did come to a CIC school. So Warsaw, the competition was there. And uh, later, uh, Northridge, well, Goshen, tough. There's, I had friends at Wawasee, competition. Uh, and later, Northridge developed, developed a program, both boys and girls. So they, they have dominated the conference for a while. And, uh, Warsaw girls have been dominating the conference now for a while. So uh, it, it changes. The pendulum swings back and forth. So you had uh, 40 years uh, at Plymouth. Um, when you look back on it, what would you say uh, the impact that coaching has had on your life? Oh my goodness. It, it opened up uh, some doors. I have friends statewide because the coaching association. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, down, it's now the State uh, Hall of Fame is at Terre Haute. I finally made it down there last year to see it for the first time. Interesting place. I recommend it if you're, you're a track person, cross country person, you need to see the State Museum sometime. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be coach of the year at Manchester College, well, Manchester University, excuse me now. Uh, and then this last year, I was in for a second time, uh, Hall of Fame as a uh, member of the 1962 conference cross country team. Uh, 56 years after we won the conference, and part of the reason we were taken in is the fact that we still have a record down there. Uh, 20 points, low score. Low score wins cross country. You, 
you score what you place. You score, you place one, you score one point, you score 20, or if you place 20, you score 20 points. So low score wins, just like golf. Um, and that year we placed one, two, three, six, eight. I was number three on the team. Um, we scored 20 points and no one has touched that record since. Uh, so things like that uh, through the college, through the university, uh, my coaching friends, different places. And after a while, uh, your longevity uh, pays you back. Uh, several years ago, we were at Logan Sport, and I was going up to check in. Uh, it was a sectional at that time. And uh, several coaches walked by me and said, Hi, coach, you know, and pass on. Well, some of them I knew the names and some I didn't. But some of the team members were with me, and they said, Coach, you know everyone. I said, No, they know me. Which is true. You know the people ahead of you. When you're going as a freshman, you know the seniors. When you're a senior, you don't know the freshmen. And so you know the people ahead of you. So I've been fortunate to be in it long enough that I've developed friendships over the years. The name may not come quickly, but uh, the face and uh, your association does. So um, how about, uh, how has your family life been as a coach? You know, there's... Well, I have to say that was tough. Uh, we have a son and a daughter and uh, they weren't distance runners. Uh, my son was a tennis player and ran track. My daughter was a swimmer. And the tough thing, particularly like in swimming, uh, I would finish a cross country meet and get to the swim meet and maybe her event would already be done. I missed her. So that was tough. I really didn't get to see her swim as much as I'd like to have. Um, I got to see some of my son's tennis matches, not all of them, not as many as if I was coaching. But uh, the family knew that uh, cross country the fall of the year was just what the family did. And as I said, my coach or my wife was kind of pulled in as the head cook, and she was the head cook then the rest of my career after that '85 season. Did she did she enjoy that part of? I hope she did. <laughs> I hope she did. Uh, it was tough, you know, to put together because she was getting ready for school too. She was teaching, so. Uh, but that back at that time, there was a break uh, as far as from starting practice to school started. And then they kept pushing school earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier. So uh, it's tough now to get a preseason in. What did she teach? She taught a variety of elementary grades. Uh, last year was, well, last many years was fourth grade. Uh, she started the uh, uh, class for the deaf kids, hearing impaired. She's part of a statewide program, and we had it here in Plymouth. It was part of a, one of the sites for that. So, and she taught. Uh, uh, couple of years after I finished teaching and then she retired too so so what uh, what subjects did you teach I taught psychology and history and some geography some econ yeah. world history a couple of years oh. A lot of different things. yes yeah. did you enjoy that part of it as well well that's interesting uh, what I enjoyed I was a phys ed major in college in my teaching career, I taught one phys ed class. Well, when my first year teaching, they didn't need someone in the gym uh, to phys ed, so I had one class in the classroom. And very quickly, I figured out, I liked the intellectual part of it, and I didn't want to be in the gym all day and then coach after school too. So I thought, ah, I could see where I was headed. I liked the classroom, for the mental challenge, uh, and then do the physical stuff after school. So did you notice a change in, in students over the years? You know, how they were, or were they just kind of, you know? Well, things change, but they stay the same. In other words, there's subtle changes along the way, but they're so gradual, you know, you, you go with the flow, and you change too, and your teaching style, and and uh, the different textbooks are available, and different techniques. Did you feel like uh, you had 
master teaching at some point when you felt like you were just kind of in the groove there or how did that well you get in the groove but i wouldn't say necessarily you've mastered everything there's always something new there's always a new challenge uh and back in early days you had uh fall wasn't the fall break it was teachers institute and all teachers went to two days of classes either ball state or had sites different around the, around the state and you uh picked up some new ideas, you took a different course, and and, uh, and of course later they developed in-service training, you had speakers come in, or some, so it helped you that way. And of course technology, <laughs> you don't need to carry a textbook anymore. Yeah, yeah, big change. You don't have to set up the real, reel-to-reel film, and uh, so things have changed. And you have whiteboards instead of blackboards. Uh, you got a sheet there. Do you have uh, some? Uh... Well, I put on here Shock Me Era because prior to my taking over, uh, I didn't find records are skimpy. I just didn't keep records. The coach preceded me in cross country, gave me a two or three file folders, and I have didn't even have all the meets for that each of those seasons. And I just picked out, and so I was at a loss. But I have a notebook at home that I have every meet that I coached, the score of every meet uh, over all the years. And then I had another column set up for girls when they became scoring. So I have all my scores for every meet. I, museum probably doesn't want those, but then, uh, anyway, that's a shock me era, uh, girls and guys. Oh, how, how he places for the season, wins and losses, and how he placed in the conference, sectional, regional, summit, state, and state. He had a nice run with the girls there in the 90s. It's like, wow, from 90, from 90 to, yeah, about 97. Yeah. Quite a run there. Yeah. That's when the pinion was on the, the good side. <laughs> I'll toss in an extra story here. You want just an off-the-wall story? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We were coming back from a meet, uh, I don't know where we were, toward Fort Wayne, maybe Warsaw. We we're coming back, and we we're on four lane 30 coming back. And um, for many years, I had a 15-passenger van. That was our personal vehicle, and I'd haul the team around. And uh, we were coming back, and one of the guys said, Coach, there's a deer hanging in the fence. And I said, oh, no. And the other guys didn't see it. And he, oh, he was so adamant about, you know, we need to turn around. Turn, turn. So I said, okay, if we find a deer in the fence, okay, that's fine. But if there's not a deer in the fence, then we're late getting back, and I made all this extra, you'll run a mile when we get back. No problem. He did. We came around, we turned up along a cornfield, and back this fence row between the woods and the cornfield, there was deer hanging in the fence. I brought the fence or the, the van to a stop, and before I could get my seatbelt off and off, all those guys were out of the van and heading down the, the side ditch and up over the fence. And I got down there, and the deer was alive. And the deer had hooked its one rear leg in between the barb and the top, and when it went down, that twisted, and it was caught. And um, so we saw it, and uh, the wiring had torn off the flesh about so big on the leg and a groove had been and I said well we need to put it out of his suffering well what do you have to put it out of his suffering there was a pile of rocks at the corner of the field but none of us could bring ourselves to take a rock and just pound the life out of that deer and when the guys got out the deer's mate ran off in the corn there was another deer right there and so they said, well, how do we get it out of the fence? And I said, well, I'll go back to the van and get the, the rod for the spare tire, and we can twist that. Well, before I got back there, the guys had simply picked the deer up. And the deer was exhausted. You know, it's, it's not going to fight back. They picked it up and got it off. So what are you going to do with it? Well, let's take it back and take it to the conservation officer. So we took the, the deer in my van right there along where the side doors are. And uh, one thing we did for training was always check and do pulse checks. 
to see if you're in your range of pushing yourself or you so we don't and they were doing pulse checks on the deer we came back and took it in the, we took the deer inside in the locker room and then some guys had a car and they were going to take it down to south michigan street here to the conservation officer conservation officer said uh, well that deer will never survive you know with that leg though it is the gangrene is probably already set in anyway uh told the guys to take it out to Reed's fertilizer plant and uh, they would dispose of it there. So that was an interesting story that, uh, and for several years I'd go down the road and I'd look down that fence when I'm going to Fort Warsaw and I'd see that one barb about six or eight rods down that line. It was always twisted. I haven't looked at it for several years because it's growing up now. But I always looked over there and remembered that deer. That's quite a story. <laughs> so how did they, how did it go in the, the vehicle? Did you guys put it in the back of the, of the van or how No, they... just, you know, went on a side van, like there was a step there and uh -huh. there was one seat was not as wide as the back seats. Uh, yeah. So a deer, it wasn't that large, it was mm -hmm. a small deer and it didn't fight. I mean, it was, may have been near death, yeah. we don't know. Just put it in there, close the door. And just rode along. Road long, the guys were taking its pulse. Uh, that is a great story. <laughs> uh, is that your first deer story from that's the coast? That's the first one I've heard, yeah. Uh, any other uh, odd things that come to your mind? A lot of weird stuff happens sometimes in coaching. So. Well, you don't want to dig up all the, the skeletons. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, one thing, going to Brown County too, uh, as summer camp, a lot of other teams are doing the same. So every year we'd be down in a, uh, the one campground, there'd be other teams. There might be five or six other high school teams there. So the guys and gals got to interact with the people from other schools. Some you competed against, some you did not. Um, and uh, Larry Boner, who ran for me, He's now a coach at McCutcheon High School. Yeah, he still goes down to, and after I finished coaching, the, team, the coach took over for me. They didn't go back to Brown County. So uh, last year, I think they did, two or three days. But uh, anyway, yeah, there are stories. <laughs> there are stories. <laughs> uh, okay, well, maybe next time we'll get some. <laughs> Yeah, well, one of the guys, when they were down at Brown County, they said they wanted to go off on a horse trail. And uh, that was fine, running the horse trails. But we took off one time and they went up the horse trail and they didn't make it back to the campsite. So we went out looking for them. Well, you can't go out on several miles, a 10 mile horse trail and know where they are. And um, but they found, each of them found their way back eventually. And some, one guy said, went through, he got off the, went into someone's yard because we got across the park boundary into someone's yard, different things like that. And then another time they wanted to go down a certain trail and they said, well, okay, uh, we'll get to a certain point and then we'll just simply turn left and that'll take us back to the camp. No, because the trail isn't straight. If you're turning here and you turn left, you're going that way. If you t when the trail's running here and you turn left, you go this way. So we nixed that one. So, yeah. Sometimes it, it's nice to be exuberant, but uh, you have to know where you're running. So you didn't want to lose anyone out there. Yeah. Yeah. We went to, um, what's the park at Spades, Indiana? McCormick's Creek, I think. It, we went down there and some of the guys took off running right when we got there before they, we got the tents set up and they took off for a run. Not everyone wanted to do that. The storm was coming in. And a ranger came up and said, uh, you guys can't be out on the, on the trails. The storm's here. And so they got some guys to come back in. Well, the storm came. And so we sat in the van. Well, not all, but some of them sat in one of the tents. And it rained all night, a thunderstorm. You wouldn't think about a thunderstorm lasting all night, but this one did. And it's not comfortable to sit there in a van all night. And then the guys that were in the tent, 
the water would roll in and get their uh, sleeping bag wet. Well, there are other sleeping bags there, so you get someone else's sleeping bag and you put it on top of yours, and eventually that soaks up. The next morning, all the sleeping bags were wet. Even the guys that were in the, in the van, their sleeping bags were wet. So we went into town and we commandeered all the dryers in the uh, um, laundromat. And there were ladies in there doing the laundry and they couldn't dry their clothes. There was no dryer available. And you don't dry a sleeping bag very quickly. But uh, that was an interesting one that uh, some of the guys got chased off the trails with the rangers and we slept in the van all night. Um, so, 320 wins, 321. For the guys? Impressive. For the guys, yeah. Yeah. And then 181 for the girls. That's, yeah. uh, that's amazing. And we had some undefeated seasons. And you can see early in the year, early in the career there, uh, we ran a lot of meets. You can see uh, on the guys' sheet there. Yeah. Uh, we'd run three meets a week, and, and some of them were two or three teams coming in and run the same meet. And... Uh, that doesn't do it anymore. And there's some schools that only run Saturday, run once they, some conferences don't even run dual meets, conference meet. You just have one conference meet and that's it. But uh, so far, NLC still does uh, the dual meets and the conference meet. So you had a, uh, a 16 and 0 season in 78. Mm -hmm. That's pretty impressive. Who are some of the, uh, do you remember any of the runners for that? <laughs> How, how big, so how big of a team do you normally have in cross country? I mean, you, have, you would have anywhere from 20 to oh, yeah. 30 guys? Uh, yeah. Or girls? I, I'd say uh, during the bulk of the time, I'd have 12 or 15 girls, and I'd have 20, 25 guys. Um, of course, in cross country, you score five, and then two are pushers. You know what pushers are? Oh, <laughs> scoring. Okay, the five people, the first five people are the scores. Then the next two, they take up places. And if they can score ahead of another runner from one of the other top five in another team, that simply pushes that runner down. They don't score themselves, but they force the other team to have an extra point or two, depends on how many members. So they're called pushers. And uh, so, involve seven. Five score, but uh, two can help you. So if you had two good pushers, that would help you out quite a bit oh, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. I mean, I knew about the five runners, but I didn't know you could have two that time. Yeah. And then sometimes, it's interesting, some people are kind and some are not so kind. We ran Warsaw once. Uh, Warsaw's had several different courses, and one year we, they ran, uh, it used to be the freshman high school, and we had a lady come over to one of our runners and said, I want you to know you set a record. That was the slowest time I was ever run on this course. Why would you say that to someone? I didn't know what to say to him. But I always took every runner and I cheered for everybody and I wasn't at the finish line. When we did well at the state. I didn't see the finish. Someone asked me, wasn't that, wasn't that neat you see him Pete run across the finish line in first place? I said, I never saw him. I'm out on the course at some point, knowing where from here to the finish, this is where a critical point. Whatever strength you have left, this is where you go and you do as well as you can at the finish line. If you stand at the finish line, a lot of people want to stand at the finish line and cheer. Well, that didn't help the person. And a lot of times I'd try to find some place where it was quiet, out there where it was lonely. And there are lonely places on some cross-country courses. There's no one around, and you're there, and particularly if you're not one of the front runners. It's just you. I always said that uh, distance running gives you time to think. And distance running gives you too much time to think. <laughs> if you know what I mean. I do. Okay. So... Um, <laughs> I was always out there cheering for the last runner in. You came out for the team, 
And when I recruited, I say, you don't have to be good, but you will get better. We'll talk you coming back in for a few more years and get that right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a college uh, friend, he, wanted to, he, he was sorry I dropped out of coaching because he wanted to go 50 years and thought I would go 50 also. But I said, no, nah, I don't want to do that. You were ready to be done. Huh? Yeah, well, sometimes it's, you know, you decide that's it. I've had I have all the fun I've wanted or needed or I do something else. Yeah. Well it was a it was a good good life, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Teaching and, and uh, getting to uh, you know, interact with young people and um, I'm sure the cross country participating in it was probably good for 